Night Trap. The name no doubt brings to mind the FMV craze of the early 90s. The controversial bathroom scene plastered across the news. The obvious sexual aggression against the woman in Night Trap, which kids uh, do have access to. Dana Plato, the child sitcom star who suffered from drug and alcohol abuse and would pass away a few short years after the release of the game. In the early 90s, society was grappling with the fact that games, once viewed as toys for children, could now have characters that looked real, vivid worlds, and crystal clear dialogue. Video games were growing up and in clear view of the public eye. Beneath its perceived B-grade movie schlock, grainy graphics, and silly theme song is a game that made a lasting impact on the video game industry. This is the story of Night Trap, how it was made, its legacy, and how more than 25 years later, we're finally able to see it as it was originally meant to be seen. You with me, Control? We're going in. If you really want to kind of get the full context for Night Trap, I think you need to look back to, you know, Dragon's Lair, a decade before Night Trap came out, um, which kind of introduced the idea of video games as this cinematic experience based on, you know, real footage, real live video, or cartoon video as the case may be. That kind of set off a, a sort of splinter of video game design that was based around the idea of how can we make movies work as video games or video games work as movies. It wasn't like a prevailing trend in the industry, but it definitely was a concept that people wanted to explore. Dragon's Lair, Space Ace, and other games of that ilk are presented as fully animated cartoons in which the gameplay consists of visual cues to indicate that you must press a button or point the joystick in a specific direction. <laughs> Dragon's Lair is very binary. You either, you know, get past the current trap or you die. Uh, there's not much to it. And most, you know, most of those interactive cartoon type games were like that all the way up to like Time Gal or something. And everyone always tried to put their own spin on it and come up with interesting outcomes. But it was still pretty much just like, you know, Simon says, do you respond at the right time at the right, in the right way? It differs from a video game in that it's not a computer generated signal. It's it's recorded, you know, digitized video from another source. You can have more realism in the, the worldview, but it also kind of limits the interactivity because it can't be extremely dynamic. These games work by combining custom arcade hardware with laser disc technology. These vinyl record sized discs contain composite analog video and can store up to about one hour of video per side. Laserdisc was high tech, but the format struggled to be widely adopted for home use outside of Asia. However, the video home system, or VHS format, was beginning to reach a fever pitch. Introduced two years before Laserdisc, these magnetic tape based video cassettes were much more consumer friendly, and the decks that could play these tapes were rapidly becoming cheaper. Hasbro, one of the world's largest toy companies, was experiencing a golden age due to the success of G.I. Joe, Transformers, and My Little Pony. CEO Steven Hasenfeld was deeply interested in breaking into the home video game scene that had been rejuvenated by the Japanese company Nintendo. Hasbro partnered with high-tech toy manufacturer Axlon, a startup from Atari founder Nolan Bushnell, to create a product that could compete with Nintendo. What they came up with was a device they codenamed Nemo, which manipulated the interleaved fields of a VHS tape, allowing you to switch between multiple video tracks. I was working with Nolan Bushnell uh, on um, a series of interactive advertising and interactive retailing campaigns. And uh, I got a call from a guy who uh, was actually my neighbor, Rob Fulop, 
who um, were, had developed Demon Attack in a number of Atari games. And he knew of a guy named Tom Zito working at another Nolan Bushnell company that um, had actually uh, been presented. There was a guy, uh, an engineer, who came in with this wafer that allowed you to attach it to a VCR and be able to interact with uh, the video cartridge as your video source, but you could interact up to four choices at any one time. And uh, they were trying to figure out what to do with it. So Tom wanted to put together some demos to take to Hasbro. My focus was more about these environments where you could go anywhere at any time or feel as if you could move more freely. And then it wasn't, you know, decision, response, decision, response. One of the easiest ways to think of that is surveillance cameras. The first demo we did with Scene of the Crime to kind of test out, play test the idea of being able to move around through surveillance cameras and see how interesting that was. The basic idea is that this wealthy man has a safe full of money in his library and he has this new surveillance system where you, the participant, is the security guy. And he tells you to please watch the safe um, and if anybody tries to break in, he wants to know about it. Watch them with the cameras. If anyone tries anything, I want to know about it. Then you can move around the house, switching cameras, to try to follow what's going on. Of course, everybody has a plot to steal the money. And then after a three to five minute quick period, sure enough, somebody stole the money. The lights were out. It was hard to tell exactly who it was. You couldn't just sit in the room. So you're trying to figure out who's involved, how it happens, and then he says, okay, who did it? And then you guess. So really simple concept, but I think it was one of the first times that you could play this experience a hundred times or more and never feel like you were doing the same thing. Four of us flew back to Hasbro, pitched it to Stephen Hasenfeld, and a boardroom of 22 executives. They all got into it, they loved it. That day we got funding, significant funding, to start what became Digital Pictures. Not so fast, young lady. Did you and your little friend Stop Philip it. have fun playing with daddy's safe, did Stop. we? I want Get the combination of that me. safe. We put together five, six demos. We did a lot of play tests. So we would bring in things like scene of the crime or baseball or and in this case the parents were going wait a minute that's that's a real image you're interacting with TV I can do this I think in part Hasbro liked the fact that this could be a strategy to get into the video game business to get into your living room to you know um, generate additional revenue in this growing accelerating market um, and would have potentially full family audience. Just stick to the plan. Then they said, okay, we want to do a title that uses this. Um, and at that point, I, I was working on a number of other things, but I felt like surveillance cameras is great, but to have more effect on what happens rather than just an observer looking at what's going on, if we could create some device that allowed participants to feel more engaged and be able to subtly change the story, again, not branching uh, or changing the ending, but in fact, be able to do something and watch how the story changes. There were all these different people sitting around a table speaking completely different languages, having very different sensibilities, trying to find some common ground. We'd bring in a writer, a director, a game designer, a software programmer, who were having constructive arguments about interactive narrative, which is very tricky, right? A lot of people will say, we don't want people to look the wrong way or be doing, we want to control their experience and, and um, to give this to novice or non-filmmakers, it, it goes against everything that they've been trained to do. 
the first concept was to take the sort of wealthy guy and you know with a safe full of money to the extreme so it was a billionaire who had you know Fort Knox in his house modern house in Lake Tahoe he was able to do this with comfort and leave knowing that he had this next generation security system which included the latest surveillance cameras and also this um, these traps and gadgets and so happens one weekend his daughter shows up for a slumber party with all of her teenage friends and the house is attacked by ninja burglars and the reason I thought ninjas would be the cool approach would be that they move in the shadows. You start off with this really simple clean concept that you know could be refined and and um, really have an edge to it and a look and stuff and you end up with this thing that is a, is a combination of bad notes over time and somehow it went from ninjas focused on getting the money you know and the girls being able to you know they were sort of um, not the key but they were very much caught in the mix to vampires the setup for what we know today as night trap is fairly simple teenagers have been disappearing while visiting the local winery estate of mr and mrs martin their enormous home has eight security cameras installed which are oddly connected to a number of traps that can be used to catch intruders the special control attack team or scat has taken control of the system so that they can monitor what's going on They've sent an undercover agent, Kelly, played by Dana Plato, to work her way into a group of teenagers that have been invited to stay at the home. You, the player, are the member of SCAT who has been assigned to operating the cameras and traps. It's up to you to help Kelly figure out the mystery of the disappearances, but also to protect the girls from these odd creatures dressed all in black, referred only to as augers. It's pretty campy, but that is a huge part of the appeal. And you, you keep your eyes open. We're all depending on you, especially Kelly. She should be there now. I'll switch you over, and good luck. There was this thing called reproducible violence. It's the first time I had heard that term, um, but it turns out to be a, a very real thing. And Hasbro in particular was very concerned about that. We went into kind of the supernatural realm with the vampire, and they said, no, 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 we don't want to see you know, vampires biting the girls. So these were toothless um, vampires and they could not move too quickly. So they actually had to be kind of sick. So they had to be toothless, sick vampires. <laughs> uh, I mean, it just kept getting worse. Hey, what is that thing? And the odd term came because they really needed blood and the only way they could get it was to auger in with a device like the trocar, which was that neck thing oh, with yeah, the drill. Yeah. That cleared as a non-reproducible <laughs> violence. <laughs> well, it turned out to be really gruesome, frankly. I mean, I, I thought that in our effort to homogenize this thing and make it um, more friendly and less scary, it, it actually was pretty creepy in terms of these, you know, strange characters walking around with the trocar. Production of Night Trap began in earnest during the summer of 1987 with Jim Riley in the director's chair. The entire shoot took place in Culver City, California and took under a month. In this case, the script writing was so bizarre because you had to do two things. You, you had to create a world then you had to navigate within that world. You had technical limits of what you could actually do, but you were cheating that to make it look like you could do anything. So that was a whole thing. And then for the moments, you could write a scene, but the scene had to motivate somebody to go somewhere else. But the script was not 120 pages. The script was like this, right, with a timeline. There. And people were going, how do I read this? I mean, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm okay, I'm here and what. Because everything was, by the way, time, right? Because you only had 
that much time for the scene. So blocking was very different. Um, you know, rather than sitting down with the actors and saying, you know, what's, what's the uh, intent here and, you know, should you walk over here and, you know, where should you, it was like, okay, we got, we got, you have 24 seconds in this room, right? So how do we block this where you're going to end up going out that door, but it's got to look natural, right? Yeah. And you got to, you got to be out that door in 18 seconds because in 18 seconds you're going to appear in the hallway. I walked around with a timeline. I, I think it became sort of a joke, which is, you know, where are we now? And I'd have to take the timeline out. And it would, had eight tracks, right? Four at any one time with stills. And, um, and I would be able to figure out. So it, it was tricky. Uh, we shot days and nights, um, you know, sets and locations. I was surprised at how quickly everybody got into it. Right? It, wasn't, it wasn't difficult for them to go, oh, I get it, okay, so, you know, I'm going to be here, but I could be over there, and then depending on what happens with the AUG here, I might, and they got into it. And, and in some cases, they adjusted their performance accordingly, which was a, a wonderful surprise. We didn't have a lot of money to cast name talent and that sort of thing. Dana Plato was um, someone who we were lucky to, to get. Well, there's something about Kelly. Hmm, woman's intuition again, huh? huh. Oh, Victor, you monster. <laughs> Come on, let's go. We don't want to upset the augers. All the augs were stunt guys with, you know, trash bags taped to them. But they, when the trap went, they had to be in a position where they were balanced, right? Because when they drop through the floor, they've got to be able to do it. How do you move? You do this. So that became the og walk. We had to figure out um, in the shooting how to be most economical. So we generally shot out each environment. The bedroom was the first, one of the first sets we shot. And the lobby, uh, or the foyer, was one of the last. But most of the continuity, there were so many other issues that Continuity like that was the least of anybody's concern. This guy is really wigged out. <laughs> hey, Control, check out the house. Trying to create an environment where the cast, and to some degree the DP and the lighting guys, really could participate as if they were making a, a movie. What was interesting is we shot Night Trap on 35 millimeter. In fact, Don Burgess was the DP. Um, a, you know, exceptional DP and, you know, went on to do Forrest Gump and not that Night Trap launched his <laughs> career. And we had a, a number of really interesting people that were experimenting, is really the best way to say it, with this sort of new platform. Not quite sure what it was. There were other technical restrictions. that they, they were very um, nervous about things that were too dark. I mean, the way it was originally envisioned was that it was um, really cool and edgy. I, I wouldn't say film noir, but it was something that was going to be um, cinematically kind of um, dark, mysterious, edgy, and it turned out to be super bright, right? Because they were concerned that if it got too dark, that it would pixelate. I mean, Don Burgess, this brilliant DP, is having to essentially light the room like everything's got neon lights. And we were all um, unhappy about that. But at the same time, it's the first time it's being done, mm -hmm. right? And there were a lot of people involved and everybody was making their best guess. The post was very tricky. Uh, I ended up using, I think it was Ediflex at, at one pass. It was the only way to cut this because what you end up with, it's a puzzle, where you're trying to figure out, okay, I got a little piece right there, and I got a piece that ties into that. So think of it as, you know, a 3D chess game. With production wrapped on Night Trap, along with a second title, Sewer Shark, it was time to get down to the business of putting these games together. What happened, though, was, you know, everybody started to realize, wow, this is tricky stuff. Part of it is that there was never a real formula. And then Hasbro 
um, decided that it didn't want to move forward, they began, I think, to understand that this is a significant investment. This is like starting a studio. It's not just the hardware, it's actually, you know, the cost of the titles, which were running back then about two to three million. With the Nemo and its film project shelved, the involved parties went their own ways. A disappointing end to a project that generated so much excitement. VHS tape is a linear medium. It's, you could, I guess, automatically fast forward to a certain part, but very inconveniently. And the advent of the CD-ROM technology in like 1987, 88, um, that was kind of seen as an opportunity to sort of jump in and, you know, all of a sudden you had a, a portable, affordable format for home consumers that had the data capacity to keep compressed movies. So it really sort of opened up all these opportunities. Sarah, we're in this huge house with all your friends. We have telephones, we have a car, your parents are gone, and you say so? Come on, Sarah, what's the first thing you think of? Party! Music! When Japanese company Sega released a CD-ROM add-on for their successful 16-bit game console, the Sega Genesis, Tom Zito and company saw a platform that was powerful enough to release the sorts of projects that they had envisioned for Hasbro's Nemo. Zito purchased the raw footage shot for the two games for the Hasbro system. Along with the help of some others, Zito would create the company Digital Pictures to develop and release these games and others like it for Sega CD-ROM, named the Sega CD in the United States. James Riley was brought back into the fold to help complete Night Trap for the new machine. Tom negotiated a deal with Sega who had come up with the Sega CD, which was just powerful enough <laughs> to stream, right? It, 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 oddly enough, the VCR was 60 fields a second, which we would break into 15 fields per track. Um, and the CD was comparable. Back then, it's Donkey Kong, it's um, Mario Brothers, uh, you know, really simple pixelated graphics. And so, all of a sudden, there was this option to play or experience a live action interactive world that was all photoreal with real people, etc. The video quality was adequate, but heavily limited by the power of the machine. Video footage could play back at 15 frames per second at a resolution of just 168 by 104. This video was also hindered by the console's color palette and the number of possible colors on screen at one time. Sega brought some of the original cast back together to shoot additional scenes to make Night Trap feel more at home on their own system. The original footage used a mock-up controller, while the new scenes would replace this with a Sega control pad. Also changed, SCAT now stood for SEGA Control Attack Team. Finally, in October 1992, over five years since shooting had wrapped, Night Trap released on the SEGA CD in the United States. A glance at the box art should have given anyone a strong suggestion that this might not be just for kids. Night Trap was, I think, an attempt to make something a little more interactive. I don't know if it was necessarily a really successful attempt, but there was an idea there of doing something other than just like watching a movie. It was it was more ambitious than you know your Dragon's Lair, almost like a graphical adventure where you're always in the same place and you're just watching different locations and kind of managing all the things that are happening throughout the mansion. So. I really think that they, they were doing something interesting here. You never know at the time whether it's a novelty or whether it's the beginning of a major thing. Nobody quite knew what to make of it. You know, we called it FMV or Live Action Interactive or whatever those things were. Like all FMV games, the gameplay is limited, but Night Trap gives the player more agency than earlier games in the genre by allowing the freedom to move around the house. You have access to eight rooms, and you can catch the augers as they walk over traps with the press of a button. A story plays out in real time across the Martin estate, with different things going on in each room. If you fail to catch enough augers, or if any of the girls get killed, then it's game over. 
You piece together the full narrative over multiple plays as you learn what happens at set times in different rooms throughout the house. And in fact, when it was ported over Sega CD, I felt more concern. Y yes, it was being released, but it was being released on a game platform. And, and sure enough, you know, everybody was going, well, this isn't really a game. I mean, this is an interesting thing and it's fun. And, and for a lot of pe people, they didn't need a heavy interaction. So the live action, real characters was more interesting, at least for a period of time. Regardless of one's opinion of the game, it ended up selling fairly decently, had average reviews by video game publications, and was considered a showpiece for the power of Sega's new hardware. Japan even received a fully dubbed version of the game. Papa and Mama are not. This is just a chance, isn't it? At this time, it's just one thing. Party! Digital Pictures had a winning formula on their hands and would put a number of other movie games, as Rob Fulop called them, into production. Double Switch, which features an evolution of the Trap gameplay, would release in 1993, shortly before Night Trap was thrust back into the limelight, front and center. Today is the first day of Hanukkah, and we have already begun the Christmas season. It is a time that we think about peace on earth and goodwill towards all people, and also about giving gifts to our friends and our loved ones. But it is also a time when we need to take a close, hard look at just what it is that we are actually buying for our kids. And that is why we are holding this hearing on violent video games at this time. That is why we intend to introduce legislation on violent video games as soon as Congress returns. Night Trap goes out and still a new market. Nobody quite knows what's going on. And I don't think the sales were that great. And then all of a sudden, there's a Senate hearing on violence in video games. And Night Trap is one of the premier, and I'm just thinking, you're kidding. It was so new, it was so revolutionary at the time that it first came out that it was ideal fodder for somebody who wanted to use it as um, a political hand grenade. <laughs> I think Night Trap got swept up sort of unfairly in, um, in a lot of the controversies that were raging in the U.S. in the early 90s about video game violence. And I think that was you know, just part of the, the growing pains that video games went through because the audience that followed video games was growing up. But again, those video games were still being sold in the toy section. So there was this stigma like, oh, video games are for kids. And so you had things like Doom, where you traveled to hell and, and, and gorily explode demons or Mortal Kombat where you rip out the spine of, of your defeated foe or whatever. Um, and yeah, some of that stuff was pretty graphic. It's, it's silly in, in retrospect because the graphics were very limited. But at the time, like Mortal Kombat was realistic looking because instead of having computer drawn character, like hand drawn characters, it used digitized photographs. <sighs> Megan, this isn't gonna work. You're not scaring me. Wait. If you saw the Senate hearing, what it looked like is somebody had just edited out the most violent things from different games, including Night Trap, and put it together and showed it to these guys who, of course, most likely never played video games, so they didn't really understand the market. But what they thought is, my eight-year-old kid is being trained to kill people. If you talk to the kid, he'd go, what are you talking about? This is like, a, you know, not a big deal. So I think what happened is there were selects that were made, including the trocar scene in the bathroom of Night Trap. They said, not only is this violence, not only are you promoting violence to our kids and somehow subconsciously turning them into, you know, violent criminals, but because it's real, it's actually more scary. Up till that time, it was pixelated graphics. And when it became real, I think everybody thought, oh my God, now, now this is really bad. And I actually did see TV reports that the object of the game was to kill and rape sexy co-eds. The, the downside to courting controversy is that sometimes it actually works and controversy does arise. And so video games ended up going to Washington and being put before a congressional hearing 
uh, where the entire industry was basically scrutinized and, you know, uh, according to parental watchdogs like Joseph Lieberman and Tipper Gore, uh, they were found wanting and uh, found inappropriate for children. I don't think there was a lot of understanding of what was going on in the business. I don't think that Night Trap, in comparison to some of the other games that were out at that time, um, was that violent. Um, it did have its moments, and when you, just like anything, once you take those things and you put them together, you can make anything look like the worst horror film you've ever seen. Unlike Mortal Kombat or Doom, Night Trap is not an extremely violent game. There is, there is the implication of violence and some sort of very abstract science fiction-y violence. And the fact that it's mostly inflicted on young women, like there is this element of voyeurism and uh, there's, there's something about it that's a little bit uncomfortable, for sure. Um, but, you know, the, the women, are, they never are unclothed, and it's never sexual violence. So it, it walks, I think, a pretty careful line to avoid being outright tasteless. And, yeah, I mean, you can definitely, you know, talk about, like, the, the, the exploitation and targeting of women with this, with this game. And there certainly is room for, you know, like, discussing, hey, is this appropriate for your kids? You know, we, we it seems to me, have to begin to exercise some common sense to protect our children. And when you say, and when others say, and my guess is the person that marketed uh, this particular game says, this is not for kids. This is adult entertainment. The fact is, you know and I know that kids in this country will have wide access to it. Want to sell something to 16-year-old boys? Get it banned by Toys R Us. You know, you can't keep enough of them in supply at the warehouse. But, thank God, because two things happened. One is sales of Night Trap just went through the roof, um, and then they came up with the rating system. The irony is that Night Trap is still on the list of most violent games. I, you know, and, and you look at what's out there, I mean, there's no comparison. At the end of the hearings, I walked up to Lieberman and I said to him, Senator, um, have you ever actually played this game? And he said, I don't have to, this is filth. In January of 1994, amid rumors of Night Trap being banned, Sega themselves would pull the game from store shelves. Several months later, Night Trap would return to retail with a mature rating in tow. This re-release would be handled by digital pictures themselves, so all of the Sega-centric footage had to be removed. Other than this alteration and new cover art, everything else would remain the same. A common misconception is that the bathroom scene had been censored, but in fact, it has not. In addition to this re-release, Night Trap would see ports to other consoles throughout the year, including Panasonic's new 32-bit 3DO hardware. This version saw an increase in video resolution over the Sega CD, although it ran at a lower frame rate. A higher quality version was released alongside Sega's new 32X hardware, an add-on for the Genesis and Sega CD. This version returned the frame rate to the original 15, while maintaining much of the improved resolution and color of the 3DO version, with some compromises. The final versions of Night Trap were released in 1995 for MS-DOS and Mac platforms, under the title Night Trap Director's Cut. These ran at a frame rate of 12 frames per second, meaning it was closer in quality to the 3DO port. Despite its director's cut label, the PC and Mac versions contained no new footage in the main game. However, it did feature an exclusive user interface. In 1996, with interest in FMV games waning, Digital Pictures released their final game, Quarterback Attack, before shutting down. Despite a slight resurgence of interest in Night Trap in 1999 with the death of Dana Plato, there simply wasn't much of a place in the video game market for FMV games anymore. For all intents and purposes, the genre was dead. A really good video game is you have full control. You're actually, uh, the world is very believable, the, full of fascinating characters, and you're motivated to do a number of things to achieve whatever the goal is. Uh, but it's a high level of interactivity, right? And you're, um, that's more important than the believability of your environment. I think any system that had a preponderance of FMV games tended to take it on the chin. The Sega CD and the, uh, the 3DO also, CDI, um, like there wasn't really much you could do with an FMV game. You know, branching, changing the ending, even to some degree just changing camera angles or trapping, 
That is one of 20 or 30 things you've got to figure out to make this compelling. I mean, to a larger market, right? Rather than just the novelty of, wow, it's kind of a video game and it's real, and so that's kind of cool, and but it's not very interactive, and I'm feeling sort of bored. And I'm gonna go over here to my game, yeah. right? And I think that was, you know, in, in, in a, in a badly sad way, um, that was the life and death right. of the thing. And darling, would you like to do the honors? <laughs> oh, thank you, my dear. <laughs> Over the next two decades, the gaming landscape would change significantly. Games on CD-ROM would become the norm before moving on to DVD-ROM, and then to Blu-ray. Digital downloads provided an alternate, cheaper method to release smaller titles on home consoles. After the success a number of independent game developers had with using the crowdfunding site Kickstarter, the creative team behind Night Trap thought it might be time to bring it to a new generation under the name Night Trap Revamped. Launching on August 10th, all of the original creators came together in a pitch video that had the industry of buzz and long-term fans excited. Jim and Rob contacted me and said, hey, we've had a lot of emails from fans saying that they would really like to see Night Trap re-released with better quality video. Now we've come together again with the objective of bringing full motion video, Night Trap specifically, to modern platforms that can best support them. Intentions were good, with a $330,000 goal that was to result in digital downloads of the game on HD platforms, along with a physical release. After the first day, Night Trap Revamped had accrued over $10,000 towards its goal. Unfortunately, this momentum wouldn't continue. People began to question if all the perks promised were viable for the funding goal. To many, the Kickstarter felt ill-conceived and it wasn't long before bad word of mouth began to spread. In the end, Night Trap would only raise $39,843 of its desired 330k goal with 664 backers just 12% of what they had hoped to make. I, I think, in a way, uh, it was a, an interesting exercise, but I wasn't disappointed. And, and I don't, again, I don't feel like, you know, gotta bring Night Trap back. Um, I don't have the gamer view of that. There are some people that grew up with the game. As quickly as Night Trap had emerged from the shadows, it had the floor dropped out from underneath it like one of the traps in the Martin Estate. The question was, was the dream of the fans dead? In May 2016, seemingly out of nowhere, a video appeared on YouTube depicting Night Trap being played on a Samsung smartphone. It was immediately picked up by various gaming news sites. And then, as quickly as it had appeared, it disappeared. This demo was the handiwork of a programmer named Tyler Hogel, who had been working on a number of ports of digital picture games for mobile devices. I had uh, worked on Double Switch and worked on Quarterback Attack, and then I was kind of bored and didn't have anything to do at that time, and was basically waiting for the next job. So I had, a, I had one lined up, just didn't know the start date. And then my friend was all like, you know what, you should recreate Night Trap and post it online anonymously and see what happens. I was like, that's an awesome idea. I recreated all of disc one in about three days. It was glitchy, but for the most part, it worked. I uh, recorded um, a five minute video of it, posted it on YouTube just to see what happens. Then two days later, it had a couple thousand views on it, showed up on a few different video game websites. And then um, these websites, they started contacting Tom Zito, asking him about it, saying, hey, are you involved with this in any way? He said no. So then at that point, it was like, well, he already knows about it, so why not? contact him and see what happens. So sent him an email uh, with a link to the video and then he contacted me immediately, probably within 10 minutes, asking a couple questions. Then he asked for my phone number and then the next day he gave me a call and was like, what do you want to do with this? And I was like, well, if I'd like to release it if I can. And he's like, all right, cool, let's work something out. Finally, in 2017, Tyler's one-man development studio, Screaming Villains, released Night Trap 25th Anniversary Edition for consoles and PC. 
Seeing a T14 rating on this remaster goes to show just how much the video game industry has changed since 1993. Fans and newcomers alike can now experience the game as it was originally envisioned, with a number of enhancements and extra features. Also, making good on the original promise of the Kickstarter, fans could buy a physical edition from publisher Limited Run Games. What's happening now is it's worth bringing back Night Trap and some other things just because it, you know, there are a lot of people that would love to see it in, in better resolution and I don't know where the film is. I mean, fortunately, I made a copy of the original timed masters and those um, were again timed for this unknown world so everything's bright and but even then um, you're going to see a lot more contrast and a lot more detail than you did through the sega cd the hardest part about making it is that the source code to the original game no longer exists so that was already an issue right there but luckily, when they sent me the master footage, it was all already lined up exactly at the exact same time in the correct order that it appears in the original games. So it was actually very easy to put everything together the way it's supposed to be. And then with the other stuff, it was basically just playing the original versions of the game several times to figure stuff out, like what triggers a game over for missing too many augs and things like that. Not only does Tyler Hogel's version present a fully uncropped 4-3 aspect ratio of the source material and a new user interface, but there's also a number of features for old fans, such as classic screen layouts for Sega CD, 3DO, and PC. In addition, we finally get to see a bunch of cut content that has never been public. There is one scene at the very beginning, the introduction. Um, there's a, I believe it's three minutes long. Nobody has ever seen that. Um, which actually explains the story better, so it kind of baffles me that it was never in the original game. And then um, the other one, though, was a death with the character Danny. If I had to guess, I would say it was removed for obvious reasons, because I guess I don't know the age of Danny, but I guess people could interpret that as a 12 or 13 year old getting a drill in his neck. And at the time, people probably would have made a big deal about it. Another thing that was done was theater mode. But the biggest complaint though was the storyline because you can't really watch a story because you're too busy have to trap an AUG. So now when you play the game and beat it, you unlock theater mode and then once you play the game again, anytime you watch a video, that video gets unlocked in theater mode. So now you can actually go back and watch all the story related videos. Survivor mode, that's another new feature. Because um, with Night Trap, it's the same game every time, nothing ever changes. So with the introduction of Survivor Mode, it's now a competitive thing to where when you play the game, AUGs appear in random places. So the idea is to get as far as you can, basically rounds, basically. You'll play round one, three or four AUGs will appear in multiple rooms. Then after the next round, they'll appear in completely different rooms. So it's a different game every time you play it. Perhaps the most interesting bonus feature might just be that Scene of the Crime is included and fully playable, but you're going to have to play a perfect game to see it. While Night Trap now looks better than ever before, the master footage does have the occasional hit of tape damage, which unfortunately cannot be helped. It's not very prevalent, but it does crop up from time to time. These tapes are also missing a couple of scenes, so Hogel's best option was to replace those with video from the 32X edition. This is the best that Night Trap will ever look, unless one day the original film is found and rescanned. Not an impossibility, but highly unlikely. But the real question is, what will gamers of today think of Night Trap? I actually think you could show this game to a kid who likes Five Nights at Freddy's, and you know, maybe maybe when they're a little older, and they would be like, oh yeah, this is this is like that game. I'm also very interested in people that have never been in this world before and don't think of it as a game, and don't think of it as a movie, but think of it as live action interactive. I think this could be an interesting lesson, like, uh, you know, what were video games like in the old days? Well, here's, here's what we had instead of Mass Effect back then. We had, this was, this was interactive storytelling. This was, you know, like dynamic, choose your own outcome type storytelling. Today, you say interactive, and it's like, yeah, yeah, so what? You know, w what specifically do you mean? Your computer's interactive. Right? So back then, it was a, people didn't understand when you said interactive. They really didn't know what that meant. 
uh, or they'd have very different ideas about what that meant. Um, so in some ways, that part of it, uh, I think it's going to be fun. Night Trap is a part of video game history, whether you like it as a video game or not. And video games, I think, would be different today if not for Night Trap. I knew I could count on you. Thanks. You are wonderful. And next time I'm on special assignment, I'm going to insist that you back me up. I'd go anywhere with you and feel secure knowing that you were at the controls. <laughs> nah, you wouldn't. <laughs> I didn't think so. Bye-bye. See you next time. I will say this, Night Trap and Night Trap 2, world of difference. Night Trap 2 is going to have a much darker, edgier look, style, and uh, I think it's going to be far more experiential, and, and in part because we're going to shoot significant parts of it in VR. Um, there will be two releases, one linear and one VR, but uh, it's going to be super cool. For years afterwards, my friends, you know, who were also in the film business, would go, hey Riley, you know, and I'd, go, I'd look over and they'd go, <laughs> 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 I have this horrible feeling that 20 years from now somebody's gonna call me and say Jim we, we, we want to do an interview you know uh, and I'm gonna say great you know is it is it Wirehead is it is it this new show and no Nitra the classic the great the great you know we want to get the behind the scenes of Nitra yeah I'm gonna be pulling this stupid binder out <laughs> you know every five years going yeah well we had a lot of fun